Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, How to Identify Key Genes with CRISPR-Cas9 and SHRNA Screens. My name is Sam Pham of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by GE Healthcare. GE Healthcare continues to be the industry leader in the field of RNA chemistry, RNAi biology, and high throughput screening, and partners with the RNAi screening community through participation in the RNAi Global Initiative. With GE Healthcare, you get access to the largest and most complete portfolio of innovative and technologically advanced tools for gene silencing, gene expression, and gene editing. For more information, please visit www.gelifesciences.com slash dharmacon. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. This webinar has been approved for continued education credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. I would like now to turn it over to our speaker, Dr. Anya Smith, Director of R&D at DharmaCon, part of GE Healthcare. Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you soon for that introduction and thank you for joining us today. As you just heard, my name is Anya Smith. I'm the Director of R&D at GE Healthcare and I oversee our R&D team. We're developing new DharmaCon products and also demonstrating applications and workflows using existing DharmaCon reagents. So today I'll be presenting some basics of pooled lentiviral screening workflows that are applicable not only to short hairpin or shRNA screens, which have been around for a long time, but also to the more recent CRISPR-Cas9 single guide or sgRNA screens. In particular, I'll discuss important considerations that can impact whether you have a successful pool lentiviral screen or not, and also some tools that we have that can help to ensure successful screening. So shortly after the discovery of RNA interference in mammalian cells, it became clear that RNAi could be used to perform genome scale or even genome-wide loss of function screens in order to identify new targets or elucidate biological pathways and networks in an unbiased fashion. So the first large-scale RNAi screen using expressed shRNAs was published in 2004, followed by the first whole genome screen using synthetic siRNAs in 2007. Of course, since then, there have been countless published RNAi screens studying many different biologies using both siRNAs and shRNAs, and RNAi, RNAi screens today remain a standard tool for functional genomic studies. Now, with the recent discovery of CRISPR-Cas9 as a powerful tool for creating gene knockouts in mammalian cells, it didn't take long for researchers to apply the history of RNAi to CRISPR-Cas9 and start performing genome scale knockout screens. So the first screens were published in early 2014, and since then, of course, additional screens continue to be performed and published. Now, one thing to note is that RNAi screens have been performed as both arrayed and pooled screens using both synthetic and vector-based reagents, whereas the CRISPR-Cas9 screens have, to date, been performed as pooled screens using vector-based Cas9 and vector-based single guide or sgRNAs. So the, for the purposes of this webinar, I'll be focusing on vector-based pooled screening, specifically using lentiviral shRNA and lentiviral sgRNA pools. So to start, I'd like to review some general features of pooled lentiviral screens, um, whether they are shRNA or sgRNA screens. So when performing pooled screens, cells are transduced with pooled lentiviral constructs in cell culture dishes, and then the transduced cells are subjected to a phenotypic screen. Now, these phenotypes are typically those that can be selected or sorted in order to distinguish your hits from non-hits, 
And the way you do that is by determining whether your constructs are being enriched or depleted in your cell population. Uh, of course, an advantage to the lentiviral screening approach is that lentiviral shRNA and sgRNA pooled screens can be used in difficult to transfect cells and can also be used to assay for phenotypes that require long-term silencing. So here's an overview of the pooled screening workflows for shRNAs and sgRNAs. As I mentioned previously, in both types of screens, a pool of lentiviral constructs is transduced into the population of cells. Now the transduction should be at a low multiplicity of infection, or MOI, such that a single cell will receive a single shRNA or a single sgRNA construct. The cell population is then selected with antibiotics in order to select for cells that have been transduced, and then the population is expanded. At this point, the primary screen is performed. So for the primary screen, a reference sample, or T0 sample, is taken, and then selective pressure is applied to the experimental sample, or the T1 sample. Now, in order to determine which shRNAs or which sgRNAs have been depleted or enriched, high-throughput sequencing or next-generation sequencing of the genomic DNA from the two samples, the T0 and the T1, is performed and analyzed. Now, one important difference between the shRNA and the sgRNA screening workflows is that shRNAs use the endogenous mammalian RNAi machinery to find and then silence the target transcripts. With CRISPR-Cas9, however, the sgRNAs need the bacterial protein Cas9 to find and cleave the target genomic sequence. So in order to do sgRNA pooled screens, you need to provide Cas9 exogenously. So for screening purposes, we recommend that the Cas9 expression cassette is integrated and then stably expressed in the cells that will be used for screening. In order to do this, lentiviral particles containing Cas9 are transduced into the cells, then these cells are antibiotic selected and expanded so that you have a sufficient number for the screen. These cells then stably expressing Cas9 can then be used in the screening workflow shown on the right that I already walked you through. So the workflows that I just, dus just discussed are relatively straightforward, but there are multiple parameters that should be evaluated before you start your screen in order to make sure that your screen is successful. So I'll focus on these considerations in the next few slides. Okay, first, before I do that, I want to just take a moment and go over some terminology um, to remember so that we're all on the same page. So first, distribution of the library. When we talk about distribution of the library, we're referring to how evenly each of the individual constructs is represented in the original pool. It's desirable to have a very tight distribution where ideally every construct is represented at a one-to-one -one ratio. Now fold coverage or fold representation is how many times each individual construct is represented in the T0 population. And as I'll show you, the fold representation is very important to ensure meaningful results from your screen. MOI, or multiplicity of infection, is the ratio of lentiviral particles to cells. So, um, for example, an MOI of 10 means that, on average, each cell will be transduced with 10 lentiviral particles and have 10 integration events. A functional titer is the number of lentiviral particles per volume that have the ability to transduce cells, and then a functional cell-specific titer is corrected for the relative transduction efficiency for your cells of interest. Okay, so I'm now going to talk about some important considerations for pooled screening. I'm going to mention them here and then discuss them further throughout the rest of the webinar. So the first thing is your library design. It's essential to have a well-designed library for transduction. So some of the things to consider is the pool size or the number of constructs in each pool. And this is important for obtaining a high-fold representation. The depth of coverage or the number of constructs targeting each gene is also important and has an impact on the pool size as well. Also important, of course, are controls, particularly to have negative controls and gene-specific or positive controls included in each pool. 
um, significantly, all of the constructs in each pool must be represented equally in order to avoid bias and to ensure proper interpretation of your results from the screen. And finally, of course, it's important to ensure that the constructs in your pool are functional, whether they are SHRNA or SGRNA constructs. Next, when performing the screen, you should maintain a high fold representation throughout the entire screen. And I'll talk about this more throughout the webinar. We recommend at least 1,000 fold representation. Other considerations for performing the screen include the type of phenotypic selection to apply. Are you going to use antibiotic? Are you doing cell sorting or some type of other selection? And then whether your genes of interest are going to be enriched or depleted in your screen. And then, of course, the specifics of your assay. What cells are you going to use? What time point is your T1 going to be? And are you going to be treating your cells in, in some manner? Um, finally, it's important to perform your screen with biological replicates. A minimum of two replicates should be included, and we recommend triplicates if possible. Finally, after the screen has been performed and the samples collected, next generation sequencing libraries are generated. And multiplexing is what we recommend to save time and cost. Again, it's also important to maintain the fold representation of the screen during the PCR amplification steps because we know that PCR itself can introduce biases. So to do that, you should use optimized primers as well as conditions in the PCR to avoid this additional bias. Once the next generation sequencing data is in hand, determining your hit identification, of course, is very important. And so you need to consider what the appropriate cutoffs, thresholds, and what statistical models you want to use in order to really make sense of your data. OK, so let's start out by talking about library design. So as I said, the first step in ensuring a successful pooled screen is that you're using an optimal library. So that means the library consists of shRNAs or sgRNAs that are going to be expressed well, and they are highly functional for transcript knockdown or gene knockout. So for shRNA pooled libraries, we have the Dharmacon Smart Vector Lentiviral shRNA platform, and highlights of the library are shown here. In particular, the Smart Vector platform has a choice of multiple promoters for constitutive, shown here on the top or inducible, shown here on the bottom, shRNA expression. And we know that expression of, of an shRNA, or any gene for that matter, is highly dependent on the promoter used. And some promoters just work much better in a certain cell line compared with a different promoter. So we offer a choice of promoters and recommend that you use the empirically determined optimal promoter for the cell line that you're using for your pooled screen. We also have a choice of two fluorescent reporters, turbo GFP or turbo RFP, or no reporter option as well. All vectors contain a pyromycin selectable marker that you can use for your screen. Now, regarding functionality of the shRNA designs in the library, our shRNAs are designed within our patented microRNA-based scaffold. This allows for a highly efficient processing of the shRNAs using the endogenous RNAi pathway. In addition, our shRNAs are designed based on our rational design algorithm that we've developed and validated in-house. So together, this results in highly functional shRNA constructs and vector design for gene knockdown. Now, we have multiple smart vector shRNA pooled libraries to, to choose from, some of which are shown in this table. So in the table, I'm showing you the library collection name, the number of targeted gene in that, genes in that collection, and then the number of pools and the average number of constructs per pool for that collection as well. Now, as you can see, we limit the number of constructs per pool to around 10 or 11,000 max. And as you'll see in later slides, the size of the lentiviral pool is very important and does affect a number of different parameters in the screening experimental design. Um, the bottom line is pool sizes of greater than 10 or 11,000 may result in screens that are just logistically and practically really hard to perform. The shRNA libraries are all provided as high titer purified concentrated lentiviral particles 
with a titer of 5 times 10 to the 8th eight tr transducing units per mil, and that's a functional titer we determine in HEK 293T cells. The pools have an average of 7.6 SHR RNA designs per gene, and again, the designs are based on our rationally designed SHRNA-specific algorithm. And included in the pool are multiple negative and positive controls. Now, each of these pre-made libraries are also available for mouse, and we also are able to make custom human mouse or rat pools upon request as well. Okay, moving on to our sgRNA lentiviral pools. We offer the Dharmacon Editor Lentiviral sgRNA platform, which consists of the Cas9 nuclease and the sgRNA. Now, we offer a two-vector system where the Cas9 nuclease and the sgRNA are on separate vectors, and this allows you to establish a cell line that stably expresses Cas9 prior to the transduction of the pool. Now, similar to our smart vector platform, we offer the Cas9 nuclease with a choice of several different promoters so that you're able to use the promoter that's best for your cell line, and this ensures the best expression of the Cas9 nuclease. And we know that optimal Cas9 expression is really important to ensure efficient gene knockouts. The sgRNAs, on the other hand, are expressed from a U6 promoter that works universally well across cell lines to express short RNA sequences. The sgRNA design in the pools is based on our editor rational design algorithm, and um, we've developed this algorithm, and it's designed to, for successful protein knockout, not just creation of double-strand breaks. And that, of course, is important if you're looking to identify phenotypes. Now, of course, the Cas9 nuclease and the sgRNA vectors do have different selectable markers so that you can make that in Cas9 integrated stable cell line first and then select for cells transduced with the sgRNAs during the screen itself. Okay, also similar to our smart vector pooled libraries, we have multiple editor lentiviral single guide RNA pooled libraries to choose from for human, mouse, and rat. And again, some of these are shown in this table. So again, the name of the collection, the number of targeted genes, and then the number of pools and the number of, of sgRNA constructs per pool. Smaller library subsets are also available, and we can also make custom pools upon request as well. The sgRNA libraries are also provided as high titer purified concentrated lentiviral particles with a titer greater than 5 times 10 to the 8th transducing units per mil. The pools have an average of 9.8 pre-designed sgRNAs per gene, and again, this is using our Dharmacon editor algorithm, and we also include multiple negative and positive controls. Okay, so I just want to take a minute and talk a little bit more about the use of controls to normalize and compare your screening results. The gene-specific controls include essential or viability genes that can provide confidence that your screen has worked, since some of these are expected to be depleted by the T1 time point. Additionally, the gene-specific controls include some reference genes that are typically not going to change in abundance for most phenotypic assays, so these serve as good controls as well. The negative controls that we can include um, are designed bioinformatically to not target any gene in the human mouse or rat genome. These are important for normalization and can be an indication of the noise of the screen, which can be used to establish the cutoff criteria for HIT identification. Um, importantly, all the gene-specific and the negative controls are the same composition as the experimental shRNA or sgRNA constructs so they indeed do serve as good controls. Okay, as I mentioned before, one important consideration when evaluating pooled libraries for screening is to know whether all of the constructs, whether they are shRNAs or sgRNAs, whether they're equally represented in the pool. If they're not equally represented in the pool, you'll introduce bias in your screen, and this can greatly affect your screening data quality. So the top graph is an example of poor construct distribution, where you can see there's a wide distribution in the abundance of the constructs, and many of them, here indicated in the red, are present at low abundance. And therefore, these can be lost during the screen. This would re result in depletion of these constructs during the screen, 
and they would appear as hits if you're looking for depleted hits, when in fact they would really be false positives. Now the lower graph shows a narrow or tight distribution of all the constructs in the pool, and this library will result in superior screening data with far fewer potential false positives. Now, as part of our product QC, we assess the representation of constructs in the library pools using next generation sequencing. We do this both for the glycerol stocks that we develop in-house, as well as for the final lentiviral pool that's delivered to you. In particular, as uh, shown here, we analyze the next gen sequencing data of our pools and look at what the distribution is for 70% of the population shown here with the blue lines or 90% of the population, shown here with the red lines. So here you can see for this pool of 7,519 sgRNAs, 70% of the constructs in the lentiviral pool have a two-fold difference in abundance. So the distribution is very narrow and tight, which is good. Looking at the 90% data, we see that 90% of the constructs in the population are within fourfold of each other in abundance. Again, showing that the distribution of the, the constructs in this pool is very tight and the constructs are essentially represented equally. Importantly, our libraries also have high recovery of the constructs between the glycerol stocks and the packaging of the lentivirus. Now in this library shown, there's greater than 99.5% recovery of sgRNAs at the T0 time point indicating that we have not lost constructs during creation or transduction of the library. Okay, so we've chosen the optimal library design for our screen and we're ready to move on to performing the screen. So what do we need to keep in mind when performing and then analyzing the screen? First, one consideration is the type of assay you're going to use for the pooled screen. As I mentioned, the phenotype for pooled screens must be amenable to some sort of selection or sorting in order to be able to identify the enriched and depleted constructs between the T0 and the T1 samples. Again, in the screening workflow, the lentiviral pools are transduced into cells and then the reference or the T0 sample is collected. Then some type of selective pressure is applied on the experimental sample or the T1 sample, and then at the end of the screen, you want to be able to identify constructs that have changed in abundance between the T0 and the T1 samples. These should be the constructs that are affected by the treatment you applied. Now here on the right, we've listed some examples of the types of phenotypic assays that are amenable to pooled screens. Cell viability, either through cell survival or drug treatment, is a common phenotype that has been used in multiple published pooled screens. Other assays, such as cell behavior or cell sorting using a fluorescence or other type of reporter, as well as in vivo screens, have also been used and published. In the example screens that I'll discuss at the end of this presentation, we use cell viability as our phenotypic screen. Okay, another very important consideration for pooled screens, or really any screen for that matter, is reproducibility. In other words, you want to ensure that the results you obtain are robust and reproducible. You want the hit that you discovered in your screen to show up again as a hit if the screen were repeated on a different day. So we've looked extensively at parameters that affect the reproducibility of pooled shRNA screens and have published our work for the data shown here and the reference is here at the bottom of the slide. So what we found is that, not surprisingly, there are multiple steps in the pooled screening workflow that can affect data quality and reproducibility. We'll discuss some of the major themes here during the webinar, and I highly encourage you to read the paper in full to learn more. So one of our primary conclusions in our publication is that fold representation of each construct during screening greatly affects the screen data quality. So again, fold representation is defined by um, how many times each construct is represented in the T0 population. So here in the cartoon shown, each of the four particular shRNA constructs, which hopefully you can see are different colors, are present in an equal number of cells. So for example, at 100 or 500 fold representation, these four constructs would each be in 100 or 500 different cells in the cell population. 
Now, as shown on the right, when looking at replicates A and B for a screen performed with 100 cells per shRNA compared with a screen performed with 500 cells per shRNA, we see the Pearson correlation, or the R value, is much higher in the 500-fold representation screen, where we have an R value of 0.67, compared to the lower R value of 0.41 in the 100-fold representation screen. So this indicates higher reproducibility between replicates with higher fold representation. In the graph shown here, we compare different fold representations from 100 to 1,000 fold representation, and we looked at the effect on reproducibility, again using the Pearson correlation. So as you can see, the Pearson correlation increases with increased fold representation, and with 1,000 fold representation, the R value is highly significant at 0 0.994. In addition, you can see a substantial increase between the 500 and the 1,000-fold representation samples, and this is why we recommend at least 1,000-fold representation in a pooled screen. It's really to um, obtain high-quality and reproducible data. Now, equally important to keep high reproducibility is to maintain this high-fold representation in the PCR steps when you amplify the genomic DNA for next-generation sequencing. Now, this typically requires setting up multiple PCR reactions in order to have the proper amount of DNA represented. So, for example, with a small pooled library with only 1,000 shRNAs or sgRNAs, in order to maintain that 1,000-fold representation here, in the PCR, 6.6 .6 micrograms of input genomic DNA is required. In order to successfully am amplify this much starting material, the genomic DNA must be divided into multiple PCR reactions. This is because we know that too much genomic DNA template in a PCR reaction can inhibit amplification. And this you can see here in the lower gel image where when you have the larger amount of input, you don't get amplification of your band. So the amount of genomic DNA per PCR reaction is 825 nanograms for 100% amplification efficiency. So for 6.6 .6 micrograms of the input genomic DNA that is required for 1,000-fold representation, you'll need to perform eight PCR reactions per genomic DNA sample. We've also designed and tested the PCR primers and optimized the PCR conditions, including the enzyme amount, the amount of genomic DNA input, as I just showed you, whether or not you need to add additives, as well as the cycle numbers um, for the PCR in order to amplify shRNAs and sgRNAs without an energy bias. So here what I'm showing you is the result of the log count obtained from next-gen sequencing after PCR amplification using fusion polymerase and using the optimized PCR primers and conditions. As you can see, the PCR primers do not show an shRNA-specific energy bias, and we obtain equivalent log counts regardless of the free energy, which is good. Okay, so earlier I mentioned that the size of the shRNA or the sgRNA pool has an impact on the practical aspects to performing an effective screen. So why does pool size matter? Well, in order to have each cell expressing a single construct in order to ensure that the knockdown or the knockout of a single gene in a particular cell is responsible for the resulting phenotype, we recommend performing transductions at a low MOI of 0.3 or less. Now, using the Poisson distribution, this results in approximately 22% of cells having a single integrant. Now, in order to determine how many cells are needed for a specific pool, you multiply the number of constructs in the lentiviral pool by the desired fold representation. And this then gives you the desired number of cells with lentiviral integrations. Now, you then need to take into account the Poisson distribution I just mentioned, where we know that only 22% of cells will have a lentiviral integration, and so you need to divide the desired number of cells with lentiviral integrations by the proportion of cells that will have lentiviral integrations, which in this example you would be dividing by 0 0.22. This then gives you the uh, total number of cells required at the time of transduction. 
Okay, so to provide some real numbers to this, here are some example calculations. So if you have a pool of 1,000 constructs and you're using 500-fold representation, you'll need 5 times 10 to the 5th lentiviral integration events. With an MOI of 0 0.3, you'll need 2.3 million cells to perform your transduction. This can typically be achieved using one 10 centimeter tissue culture dish per sample, and of course this is cell type um, specific. Um, if you want to have a fold representation of 1,000 in order to have that higher quality data, you'll need two 10 centimeter tissue culture dishes of cells to transduce for each sample. So you can quickly see that in order to maintain sufficient fold representation, the number of required cell plates will increase significantly with larger pool sizes. This results not only in more cell culture dishes, but also more media, more incubator space, et cetera. Now we also recommend a minimum of two biological replicates per condition, so the overall number will be doubled or ideally tripled based on replicates. So this is the reason why our maximum pool size is approximately 10,000 shRNA or sgRNA constructs per pool. It's really to help you keep the logistics of performing screens manageable, particularly when using that recommended high-fold representation for the best data quality. So I've just shown you one example for the calculations needed to determine the required number of cells for transductions at the start of the screen, but of course there also are additional parameters that need similar calculations. These include the number of samples needed for the genomic DNA for T0 and T1 samples, the number of PCR samples you need, and how many samples can be multiplexed for next-gen sequencing analysis. So unfortunately, I won't have time today to provide examples for each one of these calculations. However, we have made a very useful Excel spreadsheet that is available on our website. So it's available at these URLs here. The spreadsheet itself is called Pooled Screening Protocol Tracking Worksheet. And this file can be used as a benchtop guide for all of the calculations required for our pool screening reagents. So here's a screenshot of the worksheet where you, it, you can input your values in the light blue boxes, and then the output values from the calculations in the worksheet are displayed in the light gray boxes. So here you can see where you can input values for your transduction conditions, including cell density, as well as titer of your pooled library. So in this example, I'm showing you a screenshot of the worksheet for the editor lentiviral sgRNA pooled library, but we also have one for the smart vector lentiviral shRNA pooled library as well. Okay, so here's an example where you can use the worksheet to enter in section F the fold representation during transduction, the number of biological replicates, as well as the number of sgRNAs per pooled library. So if we enter 1,000 as our fold representation, 2 as our number of biological replicates, and we're using a um, library with 10,730 sgRNA constructs, and we're also using an MOI of 0 0.3 here. The worksheet then provides calculated values in the light gray boxes for parameters, such as the number of cells required at the time of transduction, which in this case will be around 4.8 times 10 to the seventh cells. In addition, the worksheet also provides output values for the PCR amplification steps, including the amount of genomic DNA required to maintain fold representation. So for this example, with a 10,000 sgRNA library at 1,000 fold representation, you'll see approximately 71 micrograms of genomic DNA is needed to maintain the 1,000-fold representation. And this would then require 86 PCR reactions per sample. Also calculated here is the number of sample indices that can be multiplexed and run per lane for high-throughput sequencing of the samples. So here, if you input your expected reads, you'll see that in this example, you can multiplex 19 samples, so, they can, so these 19 samples can be run together in a lane, which significantly decreases the cost of analysis of the pooled screening data. Now, as I mentioned, most readouts from the pooled screens do use next-generation sequencing to determine the shRNA or sgRNA sequences that are enriched or depleted in the population following that selective pressure that you apply during your screen. 
So here's an overview of the next-gen sequencing compatible protocol that we provide both for shRNA as well as sgRNA screens. So you can see from this overview that the protocols are very similar, but they do differ slightly. The protocol uses PCR primers that we have specifically designed to amplify constructs with minimal bias, and we also provide optimized PCR conditions to ensure sufficient amplification with minimal bias as well. The primers are also indexed to allow for multiplexing of samples on the Illumina flow cell, and construct-specific sequencing and indexing primers are provided as well for sample deconvolution. So to summarize this section of the presentation, I hope I've convinced you of the importance of using high-quality libraries in pooled screening experiments. These libraries will have efficient and specific constructs. They'll include multiple gene-specific and negative controls. And they also should have a tight distribution for equal construct abundance, and also a limited pool size with high titers so that you can achieve that high-fold representation for the greatest reproducibility. We've also provided multiple tools that are available on our website, such as the calculation worksheet I showed. And we also have experimentally validated protocols, as well as the reagents, such as the unbiased PCR amplification primers for next generation sequencing. And these will all help you have a successful screen. We also have bioinformatic analysis protocols for analyzing pooled screening data. And again, I highly recommend that you read through our publication on this topic to learn more. OK, so now let's talk about a couple of real screens that we've performed in our R&D group. I'll start with, with presenting results from a screen using our smart vector shRNA pooled library targeting kinase genes. So here's an overview of the experimental workflow. We used, as I said, the smart vector lentiviral shRNA pooled protein kinase library. It targets 702 kinase genes and consists of approximately 5,600 shRNA constructs. We used this library to transduce a U2OS cell line, and we used an MOI of 0 0.3 and a fold representation of 1,000. The next day, the transduced cells were selected with puromycin for two days, and then the cells were split and the T0 sample was harvested. The experimental samples were maintained in puromycin for an additional 14 days as our selective pressure, and then the T1 sample was harvested and the genomic DNA was isolated from both T0 and T1. The vector that we used in this exper experiment included an RFP fluorescent reporter. Therefore, we could use this to monitor the efficiency of transduction, which again, we expected to be about 22% since we used an MOI of 0 0.3. Now, as you can see, after two days of puromycin selection, 100% RFP positive cells are obtained, and then these cells are selected through the T1 time point of 14 days of selection. Once the T1 time point was harvested, we amplified the genomic DNA from both the T0 and T1 samples. And again, we used those PCR conditions and reagents where we could maintain the 1,000-fold representation. And then we performed the next generation sequencing on an Illumina platform in order to determine the relative abundance of shRNAs in each sample. As you can see, when plotting the log mean signal intensity or the log mean counts comparing T1 to T0, you're able to identify both enriched and depleted shRNAs. We then analyzed our data further for depleted shRNAs in order to identify genes that, when silenced, negatively affect cell viability. Now, before we look at the results of the screen, one of the things we look at initially when analyzing the data is the reproducibility between biological replicates. So shown here are the counts per construct for replicate A and replicate B. And this graph shows really high reproducibility between replicates with an R value of 0 0.97. Next, we determined which constructs we would consider hits. We identified hits by how strongly and how significantly the experimental constructs are depleted at the T1 time point compared to the constructs in the T0 time point. And we considered constructs significant if they were at least two-fold depleted and had an adjusted p-value of less than 0.05. 
We then determine the z-score, or the number of standard deviations away from the mean for each construct. So shown here is a graph with the z-score on the y-axis and the gene names on the x-axis for 29 genes that we identified that had two or more shRNA constructs that were significantly depleted in our screen. So in this graph, the red shows the significant hits and the blue are the non-hits. Now, if you look at the far right of this graph, we have plotted all of our negative controls. And you can see that in this screen, 99 of the 100 negative controls were not significant by our cutoff criteria, giving an indication that we do have low noise in the screen. Next, I'll go over a similar screen we performed, this time using sgRNAs to target, target kinase genes for functional protein knockout. So in this pooled screen, we use the Editor Lentiviral Single Guide RNA Pooled Protein Kinase Library. This library targets 700 kinase genes and consists of approximately 7,500 sgRNAs. We use this library to transduce a U2OS cell line that we had previously made so that it stably expresses Cas9. And so this cell line we transduced at an MOI of 0.3 and we used a fold representation of 1,000. The next day, transduced cells were selected with puramycin for one day, and then the cells were split, and the T0 sample was harvested. The experimental samples were maintained in puramycin for an additional seven days. Similar to the pooled smart vector shRNA screen, we took genomic DNA from the T0 and the T1 time points from the editor sgRNA screen. We harvested that genomic DNA and amplified it, again, under conditions in the PCR where we're maintaining the 1,000-fold representation. And then we perform next-generation sequencing on an Illumina platform. We also analyzed these data, specifically looking at depleted sgRNA constructs in order to identify hits that negatively affect cell viability. Again, we looked at reproducibility of our biological replicates. So here's the reproducibility of the T1 biological replicates. And again, we have high reproducibility with an R value of 0 0.98. We then moved on to identify hits. So similar to the shRNA screens, we identified the sgRNA hits based on how strongly and how significantly the constructs are depleted at the T1 time point compared to the T0 sample. In this case, we considered constructs significant if they were at least 1.5-fold depleted and had an adjusted p-value of less than 0.05. In the sgRNA screen, we identified 68 genes that had at least three sgRNA constructs that met our significance criteria. So shown here are the z-scores, or the number of standard deviations away from the mean for each construct, with the significant hits shown in red and the non-hits in blue. Again, if we look at the far right where we have all of the negative controls, you see that in this screen, none of the negative controls were significantly depleted, indicating that we have very low noise in this screen. So how do the results compare between the pooled shRNA and the pooled sgRNA screens? So here's a comparison of the depletion hits between the two screens. The first thing you probably notice is that we did identify more hits in the sgRNA screen than the shRNA screen. We also found 70, 17 hits that were identified in both screens, and the gene names of the 17 hits in common are shown on the right. And for both the shRNA and the sgRNA screens, there were hits that were non-overlapping in each screen. So although there are hits in common, clearly knocking out kinase genes is different than knocking down kinase genes in a viability screen. But should we really expect the re results or the data to be the same? So here is where we need to think about the mechanisms and the differences between the two technologies. So as summarized in this table, adapted from a review we published in Nucleic Acids Research last year, RNAi is a knockdown of the messenger RNA using endogenous RNAi machinery, while the CRISPR-Cas9 system is knocking out a gene using an exogenous system. Knocking down a gene is transient compared to knocking out a gene, and this can be particularly important when establishing time points for a screening experiment. 
Now, it is possible that the overall higher number of hits that we saw using the sgRNA library could be due to having complete knockout of a gene compared to knockdown of the gene when using the shRNA library. Another difference between the two technologies to keep in mind is the efficiency of each system. With shRNAs, you can typically achieve greater than 75% knockdown, while the efficiency of gene knockout in a cell population is relatively lower, but once achieved, the effect is permanent. So overall, these are both powerful tools to discover gene function in cellular pathways and disease, and which type of screen, shRNA or sgRNA, that you should choose will really depend on your biological system and the experimental questions you are looking to answer. So in closing, I hope that I've shown you two different lentiviral pooled screening platforms and the important considerations for a successful screen and hit identification for both. So listed here on this um, slide is our website where you can find many resources. Um, we have technical manuals with detailed protocols, recommendations, and data analysis tools. We also have quick reference protocols and the calculation tools that I um, showed you and discussed here in this webinar, as well as guides for next generation sequencing. Please also feel free to contact our technical support team at the email address shown here. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any of your questions, and thank you again for attending today's webinar. Thank you, Anya, for that fantastic presentation. While we're getting ready for the Q&A session, two polling questions will appear on your screen. We'll appreciate your answer to these questions so we can follow up appropriately with you. Thank you for, for that. So during the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience of how to submit questions. You can do so by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. So our first question for Anya is, how do you, I choose between an shRNA and sgRNA pooled screen? Yeah, that, that's a, a good question and one that we hear a lot. Um, so it really depends on the sensitivity of your assay and the types of gene effects you're looking for. So again, specifically whether knockdown is sufficient for your desired phenotype or whether your phenotype would require a complete gene knockout. So for example, um, if you're interested in identifying new drug targets, knockdown might be a more relevant phenotype than knockout since we know that most drugs act um, by not completely knocking out their target. Um, certainly, recent publications that compared both types of pooled screens have shown that sgRNA screens have higher sensitivity or penetrance due to knockout versus knockdown. Great, thank you. Our next question is um, from a viewer who says, I would like to do a pooled screen, but I'm not comfortable with performing next generation sequencing. Do you have a service for this? Um, no, we don't provide um, uh, next generation sequencing as a service, but we do provide the next generation sequencing primers and the detailed library preparation protocols that I mentioned. Um, and we also do have recommendations for next-gen sequencing providers that can do this work. Um, one thing to note is that um, if you have access to a core um, next-gen sequencing facility, most of these core facilities are able to perform this type of sequencing. It is fairly standard. Um, and then for analysis of the next-gen sequencing data, we do have the bioinformatics analysis protocol that's available on our website. Our next viewer asks, why do we need to perform the trans transduction so that there's only one integrant in each cell? Um, so we recommend um, doing the transduction at that low MOI that I mentioned, so there's only one integrant in each cell, and because this ensures that the phenotype that you're seeing results from that construct targeting one gene and the cell enrichment and depletion in the population can be clearly analyzed. Um, if you were to have more than one integration per cell, this can potentially result in a greater number of false positives. Great. Um, so the next question goes back to biological replicates, and the viewer asked, do you really need multiple biological replicates for the experiment? 
Yeah, um, having more replicates per screen can account for experimental variability that we know exists from, from day to day. Um, and we um, recommend at least two experimental replicates for a pooled screen. However, one thing I did want to point out is that in our publication in the journal Biomolecular Screening, we actually found that it's more important to have higher fold representation rather than having multiple replicates in order to get better results. So if you are limited in, um, in your um, cells or your assay um, in terms of the number of biological rep um, replicates, it is more important to have that higher fold representation. Ideally, you'd want both, but if you had to choose, that higher fold representation is more important. Okay. So another viewer asks, um, I have my own gene list that I'm interested in. Can you make a pooled library with that? Yes. We can certainly make custom libraries for both shRNAs and sgRNAs. Um, again, you can contact our technical support team or um, go to our website for more information on those custom libraries. Okay. Um, our next viewer asks, uh, you said you have about 10 sgRNAs per gene. Why do you need so many? Yeah, the reason um, that we developed our pools with 10 sgRNAs per gene is to be able to provide greater confidence in the screening results based on this depth of coverage. So, um, for example, if the library only had two sgRNAs per gene, and if only one gave you a phenotype and the other didn't, it'd be hard for you to determine whether this was a high confidence hit or not. So with more reagents per gene, you can have more confidence in your hits if multiple constructs do result in your phenotype. Um, our next viewer says, uh, I've never done a pooled screen before, but it seems like this might be feasible in my lab. How hard is it to get started? Uh, so I don't think it's hard to get started, and, and clearly there are multiple examples in the literature, so multiple labs are doing these types of screens. Um, of course, there are some basic requirements needed, like tissue culture capabilities, and the ability to work with lentiviral particles at your institution. In the US, this requires biosafety level two tissue culture, which is actually the same requirement as for culturing HeLa cells. Um, in terms of logistics, uh, many screens can be performed using 10 centimeter tissue culture dishes, and um, the number of dishes can all fit in one incubator, so it's, I think it's definitely feasible in many labs. That's great. Um, our next viewer says, or he asks, do you sell the glycerol stocks of the pool so that I can make my own lentiviral particles? No, um, we actually only offer the pools as packaged lentiviral particles. And um, part of the reason for this is that, um, like I said, we do all of the QC I talked about, and we provide all of this QC to you with the library. And this really ensures that you've, you're starting off with a high quality library. We've done a lot of optimization internally, and we've optimized the lentiviral packaging process um, to ensure that we get a very tight distribution of the library. Um, we also can get really high titer particles. And like I said, those two things are really important to get that high fold representation. And we, all, we do get almost 100% recovery of the constructs put in the, into the pool once packaged. So these lentiviral particles um, libraries are, are really high quality libraries for you to start your screen with. Um, our next participant says, it's hard for me to get a lot of cells. If I only have enough cells for 50-fold representation, will my screen still work? Yeah, 50-fold representation, um, that's definitely not ideal. Um, and it probably will require repeating the screen to get more confidence in your hit li list. Um, it's likely that you'll have more false positives and false negatives in your screen which ultimately means that you'll probably be following up on genes that are not true hits, and it's quite possible that you'll miss genes that may be true hits um, if you use only a 50-fold representation. Okay, so our next viewer says, um, I, work primary, I work in primary cells that are hard to culture. What is your recommendation for screening? Yeah, pri primary cells are tricky. Um, so what we would recommend is that you run the screen in a surrogate cell line that closely resembles your primary cells but are actually easier to culture. And then as part of the follow-up, you can actually look further at your high confidence hits 
in your primary cells um, to examine the role of these genes um, in that setting of, of the more relevant setting of primary cells. Okay. We have uh, time for one more question, and the viewer says, I'm interested in performing a pool screen, but I've never worked with lentiviral particles. What do I need to get started? Yeah, so um, we recommend um, starting small. Um, first, uh, one of the things we recommend is to um, determine the optimal promoter for your cell type, and then use um, non-targeting and a positive control to determine functional titer for your cell line, and then, of course, the optimal growth and delivery conditions for your cells. Okay, thank you so much for all those uh, answers. If you submitted a question through the Q&A button and it was not answered, someone will get back to you regarding your inquiry. If you have further questions that you did not submit during this broadcast, please email them to ts.dharmacon at ge.com. With the questions done, I would just like to ask our speaker for any final comments. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's attended. I hope it's been a helpful webinar for you, and I wish you much success in your next pooled screen. Thank you. Um, I would also like to thank our sponsor, GE Healthcare, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through July of 2016. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thank you. See you again next time, and goodbye. <laughs>